Um, today I'll be talking about this uh, work on causal inference and uh, Markov equivalence. Um, oh, this is Amin, the first is my, my student, and also this is Gigi Zhang. Um, and uh, I, I will try to give a light talk explaining the general ideas of the pro which problem uh, we are claiming that we are making progress. Um, <clears throat> The, I'm trying to lose some weight, and I'm trying to understand the relationship between uh, variables such as uh, exercise and diet on the, my cholesterol level, my weight, and so on. Then I collect a lot of data, and, uh, and then this is the plot that I have. Here, for example, is a, a two by two. Uh, I am analyzing these two variables, uh, amount of exercise in hours, deliberate exercise, uh, and the cholesterol level. And you can see that through this plot, it seems that you have a, a positive uh, correlation that as the amount of exercise goes up, the, the, the time that I spend doing my deliberate exercise, it seems that the cholesterol is going up. I already saw some faces here. People is very surprised. This is like, what's happening here? Um, but this is what the data is telling us. Then <clears throat> I'll do some operation here in the same data set, and I'll do something called uh, stratification or conditioning. And I have by the different uh, age groups. This is from 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and so on. And then I can pick here one of my age group, and I would see that in, within this age group, it seems that the amount of exercise is growing and the cholesterol is decreasing. Then um, the, the, the question, uh, and, and this kind of leads possibly to some uh, investigation because this is the same data, just I'm slicing the data in a different way. Um, in causality, people is not very impressed. They will say that, oh, I know that all this, these different views are just the association, that is the P of, related to the, the distribution probability of P of cholesterol given exercise, which is different than the causal effect of the, the P of cholesterol given due exercise. Um, the, and, and the difference between these two distributions is co called confounding bias. This is one of the major obstacles, well acknowledged and understood, major obstacles to, to do causal inference or to get any causal conclusion that, or meaningful conclusions in my bias way of thinking. Um, then I am with these two different views of the data, the, the view one uh, on, the, on, the, on the left, that is the, the blue one, that seems to say that Elias stay at home, this will be better to your cholesterol, and the view in the right that is saying that I should go to the gym after work. Um, the, the, one, the first one is a kind of tempting proposition, perhaps I shouldn't go to the gym. Um, then the question here is like, what should we do? Which one should I use for my own personal decision making? I want to decide my life and try to improve and be better. Uh, and it turns out that the data, same data, this is just different views of the data, same data, there is no way that we can distinguish this true. This is just correlation, there is nothing surprising in this data set, there is nothing in the logic or the, the language of, of correlations that will tell that having this change in the slope or the sign of the slope, will, there, there is some kind of, this is not possible. Um, and I still need to know what I will do. Solution lies in, uh, as we know in causal inference, the causal graph. That is essentially the explanation or the, the data generating model for these two different plots. The causal graph here is very intuitive, uh, baby graph, just so, to convey the point. Uh, we have the, each variable, each node is a variable. Uh, we have one for exercise, another for cholesterol, and another for age. You can see that age has an arrow from age to exercise saying that we can see the shift uh, in the graph in the right, that depending on the, the age, the, the cholesterol is increasing. Uh, and also we have uh, an edge from age to, this is age from exercise. The amount of exercise is changing with age. And you also have an arrow from age to cholesterol that uh, age is modulating the relationship between exercise <clears throat> and cholesterol. You can see that there is some kind of change in slope for the different age groups. Then from the graph that I'm claiming that is the solution or we understand in the field that is the solution, you can by inspection see that the first graph that is some, we are not using the age in the view. We are ignoring the column age which there is an open backdoor path. There is a spurious path that is open. Uh, then the first view of the data is just telling me about the correlation. Then it's not necessarily good for me or not necessarily useful for my own decision making. On the other hand, if you condition or if you stratify by age, then you have uh, the more, more exercise uh, lower the cholesterol for each age group, and this is causal indeed. There is a backdoor path that is closed there. You can see that the only path that remains when age, you are fixing age is the direct path from exercise to cholesterol, which is the causal, is a direct path. <clears throat> then perhaps the, the tempting proposition that I should say it, uh, at home is debunked. I can, perhaps I shouldn't do that. 
And this is nice. Let me show in a different way what I just said. I like to call, to call the anatomy of the, the, the exercise that you play that's called causal identification. We have a query. I would like to know the effect of exercise on exercises X. Cholesterol is Y. This is just notation. This is Y sub X. The, or the Y given to X, as you said. We have a causal model here that is, have more variables now. Um, note that I added these bidirected dashed arrows, which means that there is a latent variable, for example, here between X and V1. There is a latent variable or that can be one million dimension or the whole graph that is affecting bo both X and V1. And also we have observational or non-causal data, P of X, Y, V1, V2, and V3. Now the question that we are trying to answer so far is like based on the current knowledge about the problem that is encoded in the causal model and the available data that is number three, that is the observational data, is the research question that is the query, why given do X or why sub X identifiable? I like to call computable. I'm telling you identifiable because you may read the paper uh, uh, and it's a name that we also use. Um, it turns out that we input this triplet to something that I, I'm calling causal inference engine. The engine has different names, flavors, shapes, and colors. Uh, one of them is called the backdoor adjustment and perhaps some of what you may have heard. The other is the do calculus. The other is the identify algorithm. Uh, but in the abstract, you have an engine that you input, and the engine will say is a decision problem as classic in computer science. The engine will say that is a yes or no solution. It turns out that for this graph, is a yes solution, which means that you have some type of mapping from the, from the right side, that is the data, that is the association, to the left side, that is the causal quantity, the number one P of Y given to X. Then it's a, a positive situation that we are able to find the mapping for your association to the causation. Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> the way that I, I like to think about that is like, I, I like to think that this is a principal approach for data science. Data science is nothing more than the intersection between AI and ML with the real sciences, the empirical sciences, that once the scientific knowledge is explicit acknowledged or, or articulated through the causal model in this case, identifiability of any of these queries, the causal queries, can be decided. The serial mathematical problem with implication to the sciences. Um, note here that we are very interested in this paper in the problem of decision problem. Uh, and decision means sometimes we get no answers. It's not always a yes answer. That's life. Uh, sorry. Um, and uh, negative instance, for example, suppose that there is, in reality, there is a latent variable between X and V3, this red arrow that I added. Uh, then the answer will be move from a yes to a no, which means that there is no real mapping between the association to the causation. That's unfortunate. We can do all gimmick if the, uh, in the world. We can play smart data scientists or use the latest machine learning, but there's essentially no, there's no meaning in whatever you are in outputting from our analysis. We can pretend to ourselves that we are, but uh, theory says that there is no meaning. And that's, that's very nice. Uh, I will not read the whole uh, passage here, but essentially what I'm saying is that there are completeness results. There are some authors here about the completeness started from Pro and Tian 2002, that when you have a collection of observational and experimental data, we know that this yes and no answer is all what you need. Uh, I recommend uh, my bias way at the advertisement here, our survey in the proceeding of the National Academy of Science, that we are trying to summarize some of these results. That's, that's great. I'm very proud. I hope that the community is proud. This is very great. Congratulations. But in practice, many times, practical, complex, high dimension situations may be very hard to get the precise causal model, which means that we cannot get, if there is, the, we cannot answer the decision problem itself, um, which seems to suggest that we are back in square zero. Recall the, the logic that, how I'm conducting here the discussion, the conversation. I said, we have this data, is observational. Now I'm between these two, should I do exercise, yes or no? And I show the data stratified by age or not stratified. And I say, it is impossible to get the answer, which one is the correct plot. And I say the solution lies in having the causal graph. Then I'm showing a lot of strong results when you do have the causal graph. Now I'm saying in many settings, we don't have the causal graph or the, precise, the detailed causal graph. Then it seems that I'm, uh, we're in a bad, bad situation, a bad shape. Um, one natural question that you could ask, we are kind of tight on time, but I'm sure that you would ask me, is like, okay, Elias, that seems sad, but why you don't try to learn the causal graph from data? It's kind of the natural question. And it turns out, to, in general, not to be possible. In general, you cannot do that. Uh, and the reason is, suppose that you have these different graphs, um, 
The difference are sometimes arrows, but usually they're bidirected, at least in this case, they're bidirected arrows. But they have graph G1, G2, G3, and could be many, and those are just some of them. And it turns out that the, each of these graphs uh, could be generating the same observation, non-causal or observational distribution over these five variables, X, V1, V2, and, and V3, and V4. Then one of the graphs, let's say G1, generated the data. I don't know if it, I don't have access to the left side. I just see the observation distribution. Now I'm incapable to distinguish if it's G1, G2, or G3. They have some kind of the same capabilities, generating capabilities. Then we are kind of in a bad situation. We cannot pick them. There is not one-to-one -one mapping. Then what we'll do, we're trying to summarize whatever you can get from this data, and we use some summary graph uh, to summarize all elements uh, of this uh, um, equivalence, ah, this is called the equivalence class, or Markov equivalence class, that are all models that share the same condition independences. <clears throat> what we'll do, instead of going one by one and trying to list, let's operate in a summary graph. In this case, the summary that we use is a partial ancestral graph, or PEG as none, um, for multiple reasons. Um, and the PEGs, uh, different types of encoding for the PEG, one of them that we have circles. Note that there is a circle, a bubble, uh, a circle in V2, which means that we don't know if it's a tail or an arrowhead. Then there is a structure uncertainty there. And also we have uh, some Vs, this V, that is denoting that uh, it's possible that there is a latent variable in reality inducing path, but let's, a latent variable between, for example, here. If there is a V, there is no latent variable between X and V4, for example. Then that's the, the, the meaning of the V. Then it's possible that there is a latent between V2 and X because there is no V there. Then that's the meaning of the PEG. Now you can naturally write the same version of the identification problem. I don't like this name, but I'm calling here the more data-driven version. Not fully, but I would say data-driven version of identification. That first we don't have the model, but then we can do some type of structural learning, uh, for example, using the FCI, and then we get uh, uh, the PEG. Now we have a different, we don't have a causal inference engine, what I'm calling relaxed causal inference engine. This is the contribution of the paper. And then you can ask the same question. Can you decide if the query y do x is computable from the observational distribution with whatever uh, summary graph or PEG you learn? Um, note, here that the, oops, note here that the yes means that if the effect identifiable means the effect is identifiable in, any, in every model in the equivalence class and have the same expression. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to know which one to pick. Um, Two quick notes. Uh, one, uh, this is my, my take. There is some people that don't agree, but my belief enumeration is totally impossible in this case. Some people could say, let's go one by one, element by element, by the, the, the summary graph, and let's use the Tian's algorithm, the algorithm that I said in the beginning. We could do that. The algorithm is great. Um, don't think it's possible. Even DAGs without latents is already a super exponential number of DAGs uh, with latent figs that I cannot play with more than 10 variables, possibly. We could try, but it's, uh, I don't think it's possible. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 and the other thing is that the number of no answers from the exercise, if you compare PEG versus DAGs, we get much more no answers because the model is much more relaxed. Sometimes I have 10,000 DAGs behind the equivalence class. If there is one DAG that is saying no, I will say no because I don't know if this is the guy that generated the data. Then you get much more no's. Um, that's good. Then let me, now, now this is, I, I hope that everyone is with me until this point. Now I will, I will throw a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, observations to the causal inference people, a little bit more of the details. Uh, we would like to re revisit the identification, but stay with me if you're not a causal inference person. Uh, the, the, let's revisit identification in DAGs that will have very powerful results in order to answer this question about the data-driven identification problem. Um, one key notion, or maybe the most important notion that we have is the idea of C-component. Uh, two nodes are in the same C-component if they are connected to these bidirected paths, paths through these dashed arrows. For example, here, X and C means confounded. Then it means that X V4 is in the same component, V4 and V3 is in the same component, and X and V3 is in the same C component, which is somewhat related to they are entangled in some way that there is confounding, messing up how these guys are moving. Um, another notion that we will use is the notion of Q, uh, that is called Q factor, uh, defined by Gene, that uh, for any subset C of V, V is the observables, we define qu quantity QC that denote the post intervention distribution of C under intervention and everyone V minus C. 
then we want to the fact it will be p of c given du of v minus c. Um, then I'm not parse the whole thing here, but you can rewrite the algorithm, uh, uh, the identification algorithm uh, in terms of in doing interventions in a single node, because how the original identification, this is essentially the identification algorithm. Um, that is just one detail that I show, but uh, is by blocks, it's not by node. Here for the pegs, later when you try to general, generalize that, this will be important to do node by node. Um, this is the, the, the factorization, Q, Q T of X, T minus X, you mean the effect of X on the nodes in T. This is the effect that is given by this expression. Um, by the way, this, the, this is the, the, the node by node, the node-wise reduction. These results fo follow very uh, naturally from lemma 10 and 11 of Jane, uh, or, or TN02. Um, then this is the main function that's called identify, and basically this is the change of how you plug in the corollary and you have the modification that you do this kind of node or stepwise node reduction. Um, hang in there, but this is the, the, the technical note if you're the causal person. Um, now the second, this is just the, the kind of prelude. I'm not claiming big credit here. This is result that we need that was already derived. We're just rederiving it. The, now we have, we have multiple uh, properties and studies in PEGs that we, we need to use. Uh, we like to leverage them. Uh, it turns out that a subgraph of a PEG is not a PEG. Then there are, there are some, some challenges. You need to know, know if they hold that. Um, one of the, the, the properties that we use is the possible C component, uh, in a, uh, th which means that uh, two nodes, uh, X and Y, are in the same possible C component because you don't have crisp C components. Uh, if there is a path between the two nodes such that all non endpoints nodes along the paths are colliders, and none of the edges is visible. For example, V1 and V4, here you can see that there is this path V1, X, V3, V6, V4, that all non endpoints are colliders, and there is no V, no v arrow here. And this, th those are possibly in the same C component. The importance of that is the other side of implication, that if they are not in the same PC component, then we can know that they are not in the same C component. And this will hold also in subgraphs. The other, the other thing that we will need is that when you have a DAG, we can have a topological order. And the, the algorithm, Gene's algorithm, relies strongly on the order. It turns out that when you have a PEG, we don't necessarily have a order. Uh, uh, for example, consider this pack there. Um, it turns out we get the graph two and three. Um, the, the, the graph two is saying that there is a chain V3, V1, and V2, and the other one there is a reverse chain V2, V3, that is V2, V1, and V3, which means that we cannot reconcile these three nodes. Then what we'll do, you put them in the same bucket. Now we have some, some cluster, uh, uh, and this is in the literature called circle component. Uh, V1 and V2, note that there is bubble bubble on both sides, then they are in the same circle component. V1 and V3 is the same circle component, we get the closure of that, then V1, V2, and V3 will be in the same bucket. Then these guys need to be coming before V4. Um, there's algorithm to do that. Now you can revisit the identification in uh, 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 PEGs, and you do bucket intervention, the intervention of the buckets in the other guys. I will not read the whole thing, uh, most important here that we use the partial top PTO, the partial topological order. Suppose that you have a bucket BJ that I call X, uh, then we, we would like to talk, I'm in the middle of the statement, that you got the effect QT minus X. The effect of X in T, in T is identifiable if and only if there doesn't exist some node in the bucket Z in X, such that Z has a possible child that is in the same PC component. Uh, for example here, if you want to get the effect of X1 in V, V is all other guys. Uh, it, it is identifiable. You see that the only possible child is V2. And it's not in the p same PC component because there is even a V arrow here. There's no confounding between. And then, then it's good that it is identifiable. However, if you, get, you do this incremental, if you want to get the effect of U, X1 and X2 in V, or all other guys, V minus these guys, then it turns out to not be identifiable because there is X2, the possible child is V4, and there is a bubble there. It can have a latent variable between them. Then it cannot identify that. Um, is if it, uh, but if the answer is posit positive, if it's identifiable, there is this expression. There is some type of uh, relaxed version of the, the, the DAG version that we have in terms of the PTO and the buckets, the effect in terms of the buckets. Almost done. Um, now we can revisit the algorithm. This is essentially the same algorithm, but now the last line, we can essentially do the bucket intervention. Instead of having node by node intervention, we replace that by the, 
by the, the bucket intervention. And instead of line two, instead of having the C component, you have a PC component or a variation of PC component that has some kind of nice pro property called CPC component. Uh, let me not run the algorithm, given that I'm speaking slowly than expected. Um, but uh, this is second last slide. Uh, natural questions like how this compares with something else. Because what's this crazy dude is saying? Um, there is an algorithm or a, a identification strategy in PEGS that is by adjustment. Um, the, 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 it turns out that those are two graphs that the adjustment criterion that by Perkovich in 15, I, I don't think it's a UAI paper, but there is another in UAI, people do not get confused. But uh, these two graphs, they are not identifiable by adjustment. That is her method, but is identifiable by IDP. That is the algorithm that I just, just told you. And it turns out that all adjustment expressions or expressions that Perkovich can get in her method, uh, IDP can get. Then this shows that IDP is, strict, is strictly more uh, powerful than uh, adjustment in PEGS. Um, now let me conclude. Um, I think I would like to think that you provide a principal approach for performing causal inference more closely connected with data, which can be useful when the precise causal model cannot be articulated by the empirical scientist or the data scientist. Some variation, I like to think that this is a relaxed uh, causal inference. Um, in particular, uh, we introduce or we solve or introduce strategies of the data-driven identification. First, we study properties of PAGs and understand how they translate, they, they translate to sub-PAGs. Uh, including TN's decomposition, uh, and we formulate a systematic procedure to compute the effect of arbitrary set of intervention variables uh, on arbitrary subset. Um, more broadly, if you want me to be bold or some kind of statement, I think understanding the qualitative causal relations, uh, including the causal modern queries, is indispensable for attaching any causal interpretation or making any plausible claim that could explain this is a, a big word now, could explain a phenomenon, the phenomenon that is under investigation. I would like to think that this is a piece of a toolbox to the foundations of data sciences that I think you, you, we are, we, UAI we are trying to construct. Uh, thank you, and if you have questions, let me know if you, yeah, thanks. <clears throat>